Welcome back to Security Onion Essentials. In our previous session, we looked at our first workflow, alert triage and case creation. Now we started out in the alerts queue and spent some time triaging the alerts. Some were acknowledged and dismissed, others were escalated and a case was created in the hive to dig into them in more depth. In this session, we are going to walk through our second workflow, ad hoc hunting. But instead of starting with alerts, we're gonna ask a question and then go sift through our data in Security Onion to answer that question. And that is really the crux of hunting, asking questions, forming hypotheses of what we're seeing, and then validating those hypotheses and answering the questions. Hunting can certainly get complex, uh, but it can also be simple. And that's where we're gonna to start today. I'm gonna to ask the question, for all of the HTTP traffic on my network, what destination ports have been used? My assumption would be that the majority of HTTP traffic on my network should be on port 80. And for anything that is not port 80, our outliers, uh, let's dig into them and see what we find. Let's go ahead and get started with ad hoc hunting. All right, so I am logged into the Security Onion console. And to set the stage here, I have a few different uh, log sources currently in Security Onion. I have network traffic, um, but I also have endpoint data. I have uh, OS Query installed on a Windows 10 endpoint. And uh, so I have the data available from OS Query, but I also have uh, OS Query shipping Windows event logs, as well as Sysmon logs. Sysmon is a tool from Sysinternals and allows us to generate some really interesting endpoint data. So that's all in Security Onion at this point, okay? So let's start off by going to the hunt icon. And uh, hunt, let me close this, make it a little bit easier for us to see. Hunt is an interface that just allows much more flexibility in being able to sift through your data. And I wanna walk through some of the different pieces to the interface here first. Up here, we have this toggle automatically hunt after changing filters, groupings, and date ranges. If you untoggle that, you'll see that if you change, let's say your date range over here to days, um, you'll actually have to click on the hunt icon over there for it to change. Um, personally, I like to keep it on here. It makes it a little bit quicker to be able to uh, work through data, but that's definitely a preference. Okay. Secondly, is we have uh, the uh, total found records uh, for our query. And then we also have our date range for our query. And then finally over here on the left-hand side, the actual query itself. Uh, so we have what's called onion query language. And so we're gonna be writing our queries in OQL. OQL starts with a standard Lucene query syntax and then allows you to add optional segments that control what Hunt does with the results from the query. And you see there at the end, the group by segment tells Hunt to group by or aggregate a particular field. So we have our core query here, event.dataset looking for alerts. And then we have this pipe symbol, then group by, and we're grouping by the event.module field. If you scroll down, you'll see that uh, that group by comes into play with the visualizations right here, as well as this data table. So we have event.module, Siricata, and OSEC, and we have 5,698 uh, events from Siricata. Now, if I wanna add another group by field, I just press enter and I'm going to say um, event.severity underscore label. And that now adds this field, event.severity underscore label, to the group by data table down here, okay? And if you'll see these uh, these bubbles change as we as we do filters and group by, and so you can quickly just, if, you, if we don't want to filter, excuse me, group by that, um, that field anymore, we could just click the X and that will bring us back to where we were just a minute ago. Now if we scroll all the way down, you'll see that we actually have the events themselves here at the very bottom. So once you have, filtered down to the events that you wanna see. You can scroll down and actually drill down into the event itself and look at um, different uh, fields within the event, all right? 
So with that in, uh, with that out of the way, uh, I said that we wanted to look at all the HTTP traffic, uh, uh, specifically the destination ports for HTTP traffic. Um, and so we can certainly try to uh, figure out what that query would look like, or we can drop down and select from some predefined queries. So we scroll down, you'll see we have a lot of predefined queries. So Zeek notices, uh, show notices from Zeek. If you keep scrolling down, we should see HTTP traffic. There we go. HTTP traffic uh, grouped by destination port. So let's go ahead and click on that one. And you can see it changed our query as well as our, um, our group by, okay? So we scroll down, we now have, uh, looking at our data table, we have all of the HTTP events grouped by destination.port. And uh, as I mentioned, I would expect to see the vast majority of my HTTP traffic over port 80. And then um, certainly there's gonna be some outliers and I'm interested in digging into those outliers. Now this is certainly interesting. We have HTTP traffic going over port 443. Um, and then we have some smaller, just only six logs for 8082, three for 8080, one for 8008, and one for 8245. Now, uh, if we dig into these, you'll find that some of these are completely legitimate. Uh, just recently, um, I did something like this on a production network and I found um, there was one, it was enterprise content filtering service. And every time it was doing a, an update uh, for uh, uh, for the websites, for the URLs to check to see if they should be blocked or not. It was using port 8080 on HTTP. Um, the uh, Apparently the payload itself looked encrypted or at least encoded at some level, um, but it was port 8080. Um, and so it, just because we're seeing some ports like 8080 or 8245, that's not necessarily meaning that it's illegitimate and that's malicious. There's certainly many, many different legitimate um, services that will use these uh, these ports, okay? And so that's why let's go ahead and dig into one of these and see what we find. Uh, we'll do 8008. So I'm gonna left click and you'll see that that brings up a pop-up and we have a few options here. The first, if we hover over this plus magnifying glass, this is gonna actually filter just for this value, okay, 8008. The minus means it will remove that or it will exclude that value. This blank magnifying glass means it's gonna filter for only this value. This is going to uh, group, uh, add this as a group by field. We can do a Google search and then finally do a virus total search, all right? So I'm just gonna click on this, this first one, excuse me. And when we do that, you'll see, let me scroll up, you'll see that it added uh, destination.port 8008 uh, to our filter. And again, uh, just to be clear, I can exit out of that and it'll bring us right back to where we were, okay? So scroll down, so we have one, uh, one record that we're looking at. And if we look at the information here, we have our source IP, 80.142 goes to our destination IP on the destination port. So HTTP method, it's a get request to this virtual host um, with a status code of 200. All right, so um, let's, uh, let's pull a packet capture on this. Let me scroll up here. We're gonna show packet capture for this event and it very quickly uh, pulled out uh, this packet capture. Remember, it is on HTTP, uh, it's plain text, and so we should be able to see uh, the, the full packet capture, which we are able to. A couple of things to note here, get view.html. Uh, the user agent seems a little interesting, MP communication. The host, which we already saw before, is a little odd sounding, but as I mentioned before, when I've when I've done this sort of thing on production networks, um, you'll find all sorts of randomly named that certainly sound really malicious, but in the end they're not. They're just uh, update servers for an application or something like that. Okay, so I would definitely you know it's interesting to note, right? Uh, next up is uh, this is uh, the GET request, and then this is what the server returned. 
and we see that we have this string right here, which because of these characters at the end, looks like base64 uh, encoded data because of those, those uh, padding characters. So I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna open up CyberChef. CyberChef is a great tool that allows us to run um, a lot of different uh, operations or functions that are really useful during analysis and investigations. Um, so I, excuse me, I pasted that uh, string into the input and uh, we have our output here and I'm gonna first try the base64 from base64 operation and see if that can um, decode this value. So I'm gonna double click on from base64 um, because I have the auto bake on it automatically uh, uh, runs that operation and we get an output. It definitely did uh, decode the base64 but we get a string that Again, to humanize at least my eyes, I'm not seeing. It just doesn't really make much sense to me. Um, and so there's something else that we could try with CyberChef. It's called, appropriately, magic. Uh, this operation, let me read here at the top. The magic operation attempts to detect various properties of the input data and suggest which operations could help to make more sense of it. And so what's going to happen is when I double click on uh, magic, it's going to put, it's going to try to run through, uh, it's, it's going to analyze that string uh, and try to see if there's uh, anything else that makes sense uh, for decoding it. So I'm going to double click that and we'll see that you, it's got one, uh, one option that I tried. Again, the resultant snippet, if we try to, to do this, is, is not, it doesn't seem to be anything relevant or helpful. So there's one other thing we can try. We can try intensive mode. Intensive mode um, uh, will brute force this string using some common uh, operations like XOR and things like that. So let's go ahead and click intensive mode. Um, certainly it could take a little while to run through. It, it, it didn't take that long at this point, um, which is great. And you'll see that we now have some options here. So over here on the right hand side, it gives you some information about um, the properties and what it's trying to do, uh, what the resultant snippet is. And if we like the snippet, we can click this recipe to load and that will, uh, that will run through the operations. If I scroll down, really what I'm looking for is did any of these operations or these recipes, um, did they result in a snippet that looks uh, plain text or familiar or something that might be useful, right? If I scroll down, not seeing anything at all, right? Um, except, what was that? We have some numbers. Okay, so that looks like that could be useful. Um, and it looks like the uh, looks like the recipe is XOR. Um, so let's click on that. And uh, it went ahead and loaded it. And so the output is what looks like three IP addresses which is uh, kind of interesting, <laughs> right? So we what we have is this base64 encoded uh, string um, as well as it was also XOR as well. And we get this output of three publicly routed IP addresses. Okay, so that's, a, that, that's fairly re relevant. Excuse me, let's keep that in the back of our minds as we keep moving forward. So let's come back to the PCAP here. And I'm gonna go back to where we were Scroll down and um, I want to see, I should go ahead and just see if virus total has anything on this particular host. All right. So I just left clicked and I'm going to click on virus total and that's going to open up a new tab and uh, just check to see if virus total uh, knows anything about it. And uh, unfortunately or fortunately, <laughs> depending on your point of view, um, we have no hits from a, from a maliciousness perspective. Um, the, cre the creation date on the domain was two years ago, um, so it's, it's been around. It's not brand new, which is good um, from a security perspective. Um, it's been around for a couple of years, but um, you know nothing, nothing from virus total. Okay. So um, at this point, we need to cast a wider net, right? We've, we, I think we've kind of uh, dug into this particular event a bit and found some useful information, but. We need to cast a wider net and see if there's anything else related uh, with this particular 
um, this particular network connection. Um, so let's close that, make it a little easier to see. I'm gonna come over here to the far right hand side. There is something called community ID, okay? This this is a, if, if you're not familiar with community ID, community ID is a hash, a hash of the source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and the protocol, all right? And those are all hashed together, and that is what ends up uh, with that field that we just saw. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pivot off of that community ID, and I'm gonna say, I wanna search for that community ID in Security Onion. And we'll see, I'm gonna make this a little bit easier. You see we're still grouping by destination port, but we've got some other logs down here. So I'm gonna instead group by event.dataset and event.module. Those are kind of two top level uh, ways of categorizing our data, event.module and event.dataset. If we scroll down now, we see that we have uh, a total of three events associated with that community ID, and one from Sysmon, two from Zeek, so the one we're just looking at, the HTTP log, uh, con or connection record from Zeek, and a network connection from Sysmon. Um, so what's happening here with the community ID is that we have, uh, within Security Onion, as logs are coming in, if the log has that source IP, source um, port, destination IP, destination port, and the protocol, then we generate this hash so that you can easily correlate across Zeek and Sysmon and OS Query and Siricata for a specific connection, all right? So it makes it much easier to, to correlate between these different log types. All right, so this is good news for us because Sysmon with network connection that means we can actually see uh, what's going on, not just from the network perspective, but from the endpoint perspective as well. So I'm gonna hover over the Sysmon and I'm gonna filter for that and scroll down. And I don't know if you saw that, let's back up. If we scroll down, we see our data table here, okay? We have source port, destination IP, network transport, network protocol, and then when we filtered for the Sysmon log, that data table changed to fields that are relevant for Sysmon. So now we have the host name and the process executable. And that's one other piece to um, the hunt that we try to make it much easier is as, as you're slicing and dicing your way through different log types, that events table at the very bottom is gonna change the fields it's showing you uh, based on the log type make it a little bit easier and quicker for you to get into the data that you really want to see. Because here, we want to see the host name. This is apparently a finance machine, right? And we want to see the executable and the username. So the username of this process ran under was ops, which I don't recognize that. So that's interesting. We, we shouldn't have an ops user in the environment. And secondly is process.executable. All right, so uh, apparently um, this C program data, Microsoft Windows Defender platform version number, and then mpcmdrun.exe. Apparently this ran and, uh, and created this network connection and it's part of the, possibly part of the Defender, right? Uh, let's Google search this and see if we see anything interesting. I definitely get a few results, almost 500 results. So undocumented option, um, security concerns about Microsoft Defender download feature. So Microsoft Defender update now allows malware download. Well, let's, what does that mean? Let's click in that and see. So um, if we scroll down, we'll see that uh, the problem appeared following a recent upgrade with the latest software update, specifically this command line tool has received an update that now allows downloading files from a remote location. Okay, so that's uh, that could be a concern. So apparently this um, uh, this binary could be used to arbitrarily download uh, files from the internet, which uh, which is what it's doing. Whether or not this is legitimate or not yet, we're not sure yet. But it's 
certainly the odds in favor of it being malicious is, is going up as we are digging deeper into this. All right, so let's dig in more to this Sysmon event. Now, Sysmon generates a unique identifier for uh, a process execution, okay? And that is called the entity ID. So if we search for this identifier, it will give us, um, it will give us any logs in Security Onion that are associated with this particular execution, uh, process execution. So let's go ahead and search for that and see if we see any other logs, which we do. We have process creation. Let me scroll down, we'll see this easier. And from our timestamps here on the bottom, um, this is in order. So we have process execution, process execution, network connection, and then the process being terminated. We already looked at that network connection. Um, so let's look at the process execution. Yeah, let's look at the process execution. Again, scroll down, keep going. A lot of data here. Um, a few things to note, right? First is that we have the command line, which this is usually a gold mine of information. And it is from uh, in this particular situation. So we have mpcmd run.exe. We have dash download file, URL, and we have that, that URL to view.html and the path to see program data and then 5GHDD, okay? So not sure what's going on there, but we can surmise is that uh, this executable is going out and downloading um, this text file or this file, or excuse me, it's downloading um, this file view.html, which has that encoded, um, uh, that encoded string, which has the three public IPs in it, right? So that's, uh, that's not great. Um, definitely looks concerning. And so if we back up to the parent command line, sometimes we can get an idea of how uh, this process is being started by looking at the parent command line or the parent executable. Like if it's a, a PowerShell, um, you know, then that would give us some indication. Um, but from here, we're just seeing SVC host.exe uh, with some other uh, metadata about it. So not a lot of information from the parent command line. So I think what I wanna do at this point is I wanna go over to OS Query and I wanna live query this system and I wanna to look to see if I can figure out how this, uh, how this is getting started. Um, because again, there, there are a few different ways, right? Um, we could have this, uh, this being run through maybe a, a startup location, could be run through a service installed on the system or could be a scheduled task or you know, if there's a few other things that we could look at. So let's go over to OS Query. That means opening up Fleet. And if you're not familiar with Fleet, this is the web management interface for OS Query. We have OS Query, uh, the agents are installed on the endpoints. Right now we have two enrolled. We have our SO eval, which is our security onion install. And we have our finance machine, which is a Windows uh, 10 endpoint. And uh, we're going to left click right here on this query, this host uh, icon. And that's gonna bring us up to an interface that allows us to write a query. Again, if you're not familiar with OS Query, OS Query allows you to uh, query the system as if it's a relational database using standard SQL syntax. All right, so um, if we wanna find all the users on the system, we can say select star, from the users table. So select and from our, uh, our keywords in SQL. So select every, all the columns from the users table and I'm targeting our finance machine. I'm gonna click on run, maximize that and uh, we'll see what comes back. All right, so we have all of the users on the system that came back. And uh, by the way, is that ops user on there? It is. All right, so that ops user is interesting. That, that shouldn't be there. Uh, at least, I mean, not saying it's malicious, it's just we typically don't deploy with the ops user on there, okay? So let's go ahead and let's look at some common ways or common places that malware and attackers might uh, place their applications to get them to auto start. 
you know, we're looking for persistence mechanisms. And if you're not sure what tables to, uh, are available and what to query, we have some documentation over here on the right-hand side, uh, but you can also go to osquery.io, osquery.io slash schema. And that's gonna give you a listing of all of the tables uh, that you can query. We can do a search for startup. Let's do a search for a startup because that's norm. That's one of the persistence mechanisms is uh, startup items. Excuse me, if we click here, we'll see that uh, there is a table called startup items, applications and binaries set as user login startup items, okay? So uh, let's go ahead and query for startup items, select star from startup, semicolon at the end, that's part of SQL syntax. Click run, maximize the, uh, the window here. And uh, we don't get a lot back. Um, we get what we would, uh, we would expect to find, desktop.ini. And then we also get a couple, uh, a couple results back from uh, registry, Microsoft Windows current version run. But again, none of these have that Windows Defender uh, binary in there. And so that doesn't look like uh, it would be there. Okay, so we could also look for services um, and we could also look for scheduled tasks. If we come over here to the table documentation, just start saying scheduled task, you'll see that we do have an option for scheduled tasks and we have columns here. So instead of selecting all the columns, I'm gonna say select the, uh, the name column and uh, let's do the action column from scheduled tasks, semicolon, and let's run that against our Windows 10 endpoint. All right, so we have a lot more results coming back, 186 records to go through. We can do some filtering over here. Um, we could say Defender, right? Um, so we could do a little bit more filtering and that did actually come up with um, some scheduled tasks. Um, using actually mpcmd run.exe, but these do not look like the same syntax, right? So instead, let's, let's look for mpcmd run, and there it is. All right, so we have a scheduled task, mpcmd run, just like these, but this one is actually going out to um, our host and downloading that file, and it's named update. Right. All right. So at this point, definitely there are some concerns here, right? If we if we take a step back, all right, let's take a step back and think about what we've done so far. We started out by looking at all the outbound HTTP traffic, looking at the destination ports, and we looked at the outliers, and we looked for or we drilled down into port eight zero zero eight. That led us uh, on to a, uh, a network log that we were able to um, look in our PCAP interface, which gave us this string right over here, which were, we were able to decode as uh, three IP addresses. We then went back to Hunt and kind of tried to cast a wider net using community ID, right? We used community ID and we found this sysmon log. And then the sysmon log, uh, we went back a little bit further and were able to find the, uh, the process um, that created that network connection. And we were able to see that command line using um, the Windows Defender process, or excuse me, the binary. And then finally, we went over to Fleet and started querying uh, the Windows 10 endpoint, looking for this particular binary and trying to figure out how it was being run. And it does look like it's being run as a scheduled task. So it's downloading this file every so often with public IP addresses and it's downloading to C program data uh, to that text file right there. All right, so uh, a lot going on, right? Um, and at this point we should create a case. So let's go back. We'll create a case in the hive and I'm going to create the case based off of um, based off of this the sysmon log that we're just looking at. So if we click on this escalate button, it's going to create a case. 
and I'm going to go over to the Hive now. And you'll see that we have a case, Event Escalation from SOC, Sysmon Process Creation. From here, we can enter in the notes that we have. We have quite a few indicators to, uh, to put into observables. We have those three public IP addresses. Uh, we have the host name of, of, the, of where it was going out to. Um, we have the name of the, the binary that was being run. So a lot that we can put into. And from there, from there, you know, there's lots of threads we could start pulling. We should kind of pivot and cast a wider net and look for those three public IP addresses to see if there's been any network connections from across our entire um, organization to any of those. We could also see if that um, Windows Defender binary has had that same uh, execution uh, in any other host. Uh, we should also do a more forensic deep dive in, into that Windows 10 endpoint and see if we can figure out what else is going on. Why are those um, IP addresses being dropped into that file? What else is going on, right? Now we could certainly go and do that uh, right now, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and leave our session as it is. And you may be saying, Josh, you can't leave me hanging. It's a cliffhanger. What actually happened? What's going on? Why are those IP addresses being downloaded? And I wanna leave you with a cliffhanger because that excitement and that interest that you may be feeling, I want you to channel that into getting Security Onion set up in your environment and start hunting. Um, you can be feeling that excitement every day once you get Security Onion up and running and get data in here. I thoroughly enjoy um, being able to go on hunts like this and find interesting things. Certainly, you won't find something interesting necessarily every single hunt that you go on. It's probably gonna be a lot of, I can't believe I have this service running in my environment and it's reaching out and doing this, even though it looks malicious, it's actually not. You'll have a lot of those, but you'll also find some malicious traffic being able to go uh, using our hunt interface and all the other tools. And that's the final thing I wanna leave you with is you'll notice that we were able to quickly and efficiently pivot from network traffic to full packet capture to Sysmon logs over to, um, over to uh, live querying the host itself and creating a case in the hive. And that's really the point of Security Onion version two is being able to give you the power to be able to quickly and efficiently pivot through all these different data types, bring that context together to paint a picture of what's happening so that you can peel back the layers of your enterprise and make your adversaries cry. Hope you had a good time working through this today with me. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon.